Uh, did you realise, uh, members and guests, uh, did you uh, realise that once upon a time we could fish for oysters, literally, in the waters just off our beaches? Apparently they were all fished out some decades ago and we've lost some of the benefits of a healthy marine ecosystem in Gulf St Vincent. This is one of the many examples of environmental degradation over the years. However, uh, the Nature Conservancy Organisation is doing something about it. Their project is part of a larger program called Reef Builder, which is Australia's largest marine restoration program with the aim of bringing back native shellfish reefs back from the brink of extinction. Our guest speaker today is Tanya Sincock. Uh, Tanya is the project coordinator of Nature Conservancy's program to restore shellfish reefs in South Australia. She developed her passion for the marine environment growing up in Adelaide in a family of recreational fishers. I'm looking forward to hearing more about this innovative program, so please welcome our guest speaker, Tanya Sincock. Thank you. Thank you, Brian, and thank you, everybody, for having me today. I really love sharing uh, this project or the, the projects that I'm working on, and I hope you um, enjoy hearing about them as much as I enjoy working on this. So, just working out how to use this one here. All good? Great. So I thought I'd just introduce the Nature Conservancy first because not many people in Australia have heard about us, but we're an international organisation based in the United States and uh, our mission is to conserve the lands and waters on which all life depends. We very much are focused on the interconnection of people and nature. Uh, we were founded in 1951, but in Australia we, were, we uh, started working here about 20 years ago. And we're very much a science-focused organisation. So we employ a lot of scientists and the work that they do uh, underpins the work that, that we do on the ground. And here's some of the countries that we operate in, more than 70 countries around the world. Our, office is, our head office or world office is based in Washington, DC. But uh, in, in Australia, we've got people working in all of the states around the country on both uh, marine work and terrestrial work. Some of the things that you might be familiar with in South Australia include um, we, we helped to um, create the Nilpena Idiacra National Park recently. That was through um, uh, getting the funds together to buy Nilpena Station. The International Bird Sanctuary is also something that the Nature Conservancy has helped to make happen. And we are also working on a... Um, something called blue carbon, which is very much an emerging area in marine science and, and restoration, but it's about how we restore our mangroves and our coastal ecosystems to help uh, uh, tackle climate change. But back to where we're at today, and this is me um, at Streaky Bay when I was probably five years old, I think. Um, we used to go fishing a lot as a kid, and that's, my, that's the first time I caught a fish. I uh, just got my fishing rod for Christmas. And, um, and this is why I'm, I'm very excited to be part of this project because I think everybody who, who does fish in South Australia has noticed the decline in fish stocks, has, de has noticed the decline in what we're able to catch. And when we restore our shellfish reefs, one of the key things that they do is they help bring back the fish. So they mean more fish in our gulfs. And so that's something that makes me terribly excited about this work. So when we are talking about shellfish reefs, this is the sort of reef I'm talking about, which is our last remaining shellfish reef off the coast of Tasmania. We're looking at here, there's scallops. Um, shellfish reefs also include um, the native Angazi flat oyster, which is what we work on in South Australia, razorfish. Uh, those are the sorts of things that I'm talking about. And this is, a, this is what a really healthy and, and you know, self-sustaining shellfish reef looks like. And they used to exist all along our southern coast. So they're very much like the southern version of a coral reef. Uh, they provide habitat for fish and, uh, and, and, um, and they're a nursery ground for our fish. And uh, unfortunately, over time, they've been, uh, they've been overfished and, and they're on the brink of extinction in Australia and globally. And the reason for that is 
Yes, just checking you can see what I see. <laughs> the reason for that is when, um, when the pioneers first arrived in South Australia, um, it was a really easy protein source to, to capture. They were off the coast here. Um, you could imagine surviving here in the early days of, of sediment would have been pretty tough. And when you've got that nice, easy protein source to get, I mean, it was, it was a no-brainer for them. They, but unfortunately, they, and they also brought their, you know, their means to, to dredge and, and to fish them. But unfortunately, they were so good at it that they managed to outfish or overfish the, um, the resource in a matter of decades. And so what we've seen is that it's actually been lost in our memory. Um, a lot of people actually don't realise we used to have shellfish reefs across two-thirds of the South Australian coastline, but they're functionally extinct now. And this story is reflected around the world. So out of all of the marine ecosystems that we have globally, shellfish reefs actually are struggling the most here. You can see that 85% are in decline. So the Nature Conservancy is working on shellfish reef restoration around the world and we use the, the, the knowledge and the experience that we get around the world to inform our projects here in Australia. So why bring them back? Well, there's a lot of things that they do for us, but the two key things that I like to highlight for people is more fish and cleaner water. So with more fish, obviously, they're, they're a nursery ground for our fish species, and especially the fish that we love to, to go and fish. Um, but they are also uh, incredible filters of water. So one oyster can filter a bathtub of water every day. So when you think that we seed these reefs that we're building with millions of baby oysters, and over time, they're going to recruit millions more. It's an incredible, incredibly powerful thing that they're doing for our local waters. The other thing that oysters do that people really um, uh, find interesting and I think it's quite fun is they have this pseudo feces, what we call oyster poo. So as they filter the water and they, they create that, that becomes a food source for all the tiny um, species on the, on the food chain. And then that helps the food chain to, to remain strong and develop. They're almost like the foundation of life in our oceans. So uh, they, they play such an important role in our gulf. So uh, the, uh, the Nature Conservancy has been working on shellfish reef restoration in South Australia since about 2017. We started with our Drossen, um, um, a major reef off the coast there, and then a small reef off Glenelg. And then the federal government sat up and had a look at what we were doing here and in Victoria and other parts of Australia and invested $20 million in reef restoration around southern Australia. So what that means is 13 sites at the moment are being worked on by myself and my colleagues. Um, three of those sites are in South Australia. So that funding has been fantastic because we've been able to expand the Glenelg Reef. We've been able to build a new reef at O'Sullivan Beach. And this year I'm working on Kangaroo Island for a shellfish reef there as well. So here's a map of where we are working. Uh, the, the Windara Reef, which is the one off Ardrossan, um, fun fact, that's the largest um, shellfish, restored shellfish reef in the southern hemisphere. It's 20 hectares. The other reefs that we do off the metro coast are both five hectares. And to give you an indication, that's the size of two Adelaide ovals. That's what we like to talk about, so quite an apt um, uh, one to talk about right now. But um, the one in Kangaroo Island will be slightly smaller, but we are fundraising to see if we can get a little bit more money over the line to turn that one into a five hectare reef too. So this is where the Glenelg Reef is situated, and it was very much thanks to funding from the South Australian government, supported by some local foundations and the local Holdfast Council. And again here you can see the reef um, in the top right corner there, the patches, and how it looks once it's all in. So um, what this says 14 reef patches in the expansion. So there's actually a total of about 24 reef patches now because there's a phase one in the middle and then there's the patches that we built last year to extend it on the outside. It's in about seven metres depth of water um, and yeah, more than 3,000 tonnes of limestone were used last year to, to construct those reef bases. And this is where the uh, O'Sullivan Beach Reef was um, or is located. That was also constructed at the end of last year. This is a five hectare reef as well. So again, two Adelaide ovals in size. And uh, it's in 10 metres depth of water and it's 500 metres off the coast of O'Sullys. So I thought I'd share how we build the reef because a lot of people really 
you're interested in that, and I think it's quite a great story. So um, limestone is key to this because we need something for the oysters to attach to. So we source our limestone from a quarry at Anguston, and this is it being uh, stockpiled down at the port. And this is about 2,000 tonne of limestone in this picture. So for the two reef builds that we did back to back last year, we needed about four times as much as that. So it gives you an indication of just how much limestone we're quarrying and how, how many jobs are involved in, in you know, tracking that back and forth. And so there's that nice little local economic stimulus when we, when we do these sorts of projects. And that's what we like to call the restoration economy. And that's something that we very much want to promote some more and get more investment into by the government. So this is the barge, Roxy, from Maritime Constructions off the coast of O'Sullivan Beach. Uh, building the reef patches in October. And this is just some footage of the reef build happening off the coast of Glenelg late last year as well. This was in October too. We were really fortunate last year. We got some great weather windows and it meant that the, the barge could be out there um, and get our two reefs built in a very short amount of time. But while that barge is out there, it's got about 1,200 tonne of limestone on board, which is absolutely huge. The barge is about 55 metres long. And they spend, if they get a really good weather day um, and it's daylight savings and, you know, summertime, they can probably spend 10 to 12 hours just dropping rock all day and, and potentially offload in one day if the conditions are good. The crane here uses GPS location. So we work with engineers, we design the reef and have very precise locations to where the rock needs to be dropped because we have development applications and permits and you know, we, we can't just mess up the seafloor. And we want it to be a nice sandy seafloor where we're not dropping rock on top of you know, important habitats. So those are some of the considerations that come into place when we're building these reefs. And this is a hydro survey of the O'Sullivan Beach Reef. So that's, that's where they take a survey of what actually got constructed on the seafloor. So you can see the patches that are off the coast of O'Sully. And this is a fly through of the Glenelg Reef. So that also gives you an indication of what it is like underwater there now, um, just one kilometre off the coast of Glenelg. We really like the undulating nature of a reef, having the, uh, and that's really good for habitat. We don't want it to be perfect, and the more edges we have, the better too. So those are some of the things that come into think our thinking as we design our reefs. So in order to get the reef going, we need some volunteers too, and shell cleaning is where a lot of our volunteers come into play. Uh, these are some volunteers from Adelaide University and Flinders University who got stuck into some very, very dirty bags of oyster shells that we sourced from the Air Peninsula. Uh, so what we have to do to seed a reef is um, we clean some Pacific oyster shells. They go to a hatch the hatchery at West Beach and get seeded with, with the baby oysters and, and that's, they grow on the shell. Then those shells will get taken out onto the reef. So there was probably about three weeks of just myself and our volunteers cleaning oysters. It was muddy, dirty work. I had dirt under my nails for months afterwards. <laughs> and... Um, but it was really satisfying work too and everybody loved it because they could see that they were actually, you know, helping to build something. So these are our nice clean, clean shells. They're all bagged up, ready to go to the hatchery. And these are the native Angazi oysters. So these are the oysters that we're actually seeding the, the reef with and they're very different to a Pacific oyster. The Pacific oysters is beautiful for eating, nice and creamy kind of oyster, whereas the um, our, our native oyster is a bit more of a flat oyster. You can eat it and you can try it at some farms around South Australia, but it's not very widespread in terms of its availability yet. So when they're at the um, hatchery, what we're doing here is that those, the, um, those oysters are our brooding oysters and they, they release larvae. And that larvae is put into some tanks at the hatchery where our clean shells are. And the, the larvae will then settle onto our nice clean shells and then it's just a matter of taking care of them, tending to them like this volunteer is doing, and, uh, and feeding them. They're really, really hungry. So I was down at the hatchery one day and uh, we put some algae into the tank and it turned the water a greeny kind of brown colour. And within half an hour, the water was clear. And these are oysters that are about a centimetre in size. So it absolutely blew me away. So, and it really brought home the fact that when they're actually fully grown adult oysters, what impact they can have. 
vet checks are really important for oysters before we put them out on the reef. So this is what um, I was preparing this one for a vet check, and that just gives you a close-up of the size of our little baby oysters that are going out onto the reefs. Um, just before, so that's for biosecurity reasons. But yeah, just before we release them, we, we collect about 100 or so and they go off to Gribble's Pathology for a vet check. <laughs> and then um, this is us removing them from the tanks and getting ready to, uh, to deploy them onto the reefs. And you can see the shell here, it's got about 10 or so spat on it, oyster spat. And so what we do is we aim for about 10 spat per shell. There's about 500 shells a bag. 1,200 bags, so you do the maths, there's a lot there, but we have to do that because there's predation, you know, and, and we probably 10% of the ones that we grow at the hatchery will survive. But fortunately, um, off Glenelg and hopefully off O'Sullivan Beach, um, there is a lot of natural recruitment happening in South Australia's waters. So that's really good because it shows that there's probably some remnant oysters out and about there that are helping, uh, helping our reefs to survive. So here's our divers loading the, uh, the shells onto their boat. Uh, we had to use the, this spot down at um, the marina because West Beach boat ramp was closed, which was a bit of a pain, but we worked around it. And then underwater, you can see the, the fresh limestone patch that the diver's standing on that has just been created. And the diver's, yeah, just emptying those bags because we don't, we don't leave the bags down there and, uh, and spreading them out across the reef. Once the reef is completed, we do monitoring, so it's not just, I mean, the oysters will grow and um, connect to each other, to the shells, to the limestone, but we, we go back and we monitor it and we make sure it's doing what it's meant to be doing, but we also learn from what's going on because every site is very different. So we do annual dives, um, who go, our divers go down and look at the biodiversity, what fish are being attracted to these reefs, what other marine species are there, but they also do oyster counts. Uh, and so an oyster count is where they put down a quadrat in random locations on a reef patch and literally count. And our divers were complaining because there were so many oysters growing on the Glenelg Reef that they were struggling to count them all. So it's a really great sign that Glenelg is doing well. So the Metro Reefs were what I worked on last year and this year I'm working on Kangaroo Island. Uh, and that's a really fun project, a really engaged community. And um, it's a three hectare reef. Um, and it's funded by the Reef Builder uh, funding from the Australian Government and we're currently talking to some local foundations um, to see if we can get a little bit more money over the line, like I mentioned before, to, to expand that one because a five hectare reef is much more resilient and offers more benefits than a three hectare reef. And if we're mobilising all of those, you know, all of that construction, it makes sense to, to build it while we're out there. So construction will be happening in spring this year and this is the... Uh, uh, the eastern cove of the Nepean Bay. So if you're familiar with Kangaroo Island, this is around American River, um, Brown Beach, Bordam Beach. That's the kind of area that we're starting to hone in on and, and, and choose for a site. We haven't uh, confirmed the site yet, but it's looking really good there. And this here is our site suitability, site suitability modelling that we do. So we, have, um, we, we get data from um, the government and from local um, landscape boards. We pull all of that together and it runs a model that shows us where we think a suitable site is for a shellfish reef. But then we have to go out and investigate that too. We don't just listen to that. We go out, get ground truth, it, take some boats out, take underwater footage and those sorts of things and check to see if it's actually going to be suitable for what we want to do. Uh, the key benefits um, are that I didn't mention before, in addition to the ecological benefits, um, these, these reefs are very much about recreational fishing and recreational diving and also we're really encouraging the, the ecotourism that can come from, the, from this as well. And a really exciting project that has come about as a result of the Kangaroo Island build is a partnership that we have with Flinders University this year and uh, we're going to be building a, a smaller citizen science reef at Kangaroo Island as well. So what that means is it, it will be much smaller than the Adelaide Oval. <laughs> um, it will be in shallower water that's snorkelable and accessible from a beach and it will allow the community, local community, local students, but also visitors to Kangaroo Island to go out and snorkel a native shellfish reef and, and to learn more about it and to see and report back on what fish they're seeing on that reef. So I'm just going to finish with some of the latest footage we got from Glenelg. This is one year on from the first part of the build that we did and it's absolutely exceeding our expectations. Now... 
might see there's an oyster in there. Sorry, kind of it's hard to tell the first time you watch it. But the oysters that have grown there in one year are the size of the palm of your hand and we are absolutely gobsmacked. We haven't seen reefs in South Australia um, you know, grow that rapidly. So Glenelg has something special going on that we're still to fully understand, but it's fantastic. Uh, my colleague went diving on the reef last weekend and she sent back some more footage and she was absolutely, um, yeah, over the moon too because she just went, Tanya, it's a fully fledged reef. And, you know, that's, that's what we want. That's what we're hoping for. And we thought it might be a matter of years to achieve that. Here's our diver showing you a, a boulder. And you can hear the snapping shrimp in the background. That's a sign of a healthy reef. So oysters can hear. And if they hear the snapping shrimp, the larvae will swim towards that. So this footage was taken with a ROV, which is basically an underwater drone. And uh, we had no idea what we were going to expect when we sent it down there. And we were, yeah, it was really exciting. I mean, schools of, of young fish swimming through. Um, our divers have reported very big schools of squid. There's been King George whiting spotted. There's blue swimmer crabs. So we already have this really exciting ecosystem coming back. And so it's going to be very exciting to, to see where that goes in, in the coming years. And so as we, as we monitor every year and we get more footage and, and videos and, and photos of the reef, we'll be we're sharing that with the community. Um, but we, yeah, we really want South Australians to, um, to, to grow their awareness about these reefs and to also to, um, to know that these are a legacy for, for both ourselves and for future generations. So I'll leave it there. But... I'm sure there might be some questions, but thank you so much. It's a privilege. Thank you, Daniel. I saw those uh, piles of limestone on the Port River the other week, and I just wondered what the hell they were. Yeah, <laughs> now I know. There's, there are some questions, and thanks. I've got one off the bat. Uh, just wondering, what's the cost per hectare, say, total, to put one in? And then the Part B question is, what about those reefs they, they generate when they sink a ship? And uh, yeah. do they create oysters as well or, or no? <laughs> yeah. Well, um, regarding per hectare, I, I can only, what I can say is like a five hectare build. It's so dependent on location and other things. But you're looking at about $1.5 million um, and per reef, but it, that can vary. Um, and with regards to the, the other types of artificial reefs, um, what they do is they just displace fish from the environment to and, uh, and congregate them on that reef, but they don't actually create the habitat that an oyster reef creates. So there's quite a big difference. Um, so some people will refer to them as like a fish congregation, you know, device or, or you know, reef. Um, but all they do is they just attract the fish for, for fishermen, whereas this reef creates a nursery ground, creates habitat, it, it brings on along the other species... The, uh, the other reefs, not, not as far as we know. No, they just congregate them. Yep. Could they be, could they be adapted? Is there a way of taking a bunch of tyres that they put down there and somehow seeding them in a way that could...? Yeah, I think it's the, the limestone's a very important role in all of this because uh, if you... Limestone is thousands of years of shells building up and, and it's the certain properties of limestone that the oysters are attracted to so they can smell it. Yeah, they sniff it out. So, um, so it's found, we've found that to be the most effective substrate to use. They will attach to wood, but the wood will rot away. They will, they will attach to other things. But limestone is the best way to replicate what would have been there before it all got dredged up. Mm. Yeah, sorry. Th thank you for a very interesting talk. The, um, just take you back to the beginning of your address. You talked about the fact that there were once shorefish reefs off the Adelaide coast um, and I'm, I'm wondering the conditions in which those shorefish reefs collapsed and why those conditions won't exist now that you're creating new ones. What's, what's different that's going to keep these alive? Mm. One of the things that um, caused the collapse of these reefs first of all was overfishing but then once um, these people realised that the oysters were growing on this, this base of 
well, like a limestone base, and they realised it was a fantastic um, uh, source of lime. And so they dredged all that up and they li and literally created what we call an oyster cement that was used to build some of the earliest buildings in Adelaide. So once, those, once what the oysters had to attach to was disappeared, there was, re there was nothing left for them to attach onto except for other oysters or razor fish or you know, other things that they could find. And so that, that's where the collapse happened. Uh, so obviously there's a lot more um, regulation and, and protection now of our marine environments. And um, we have marine parks being one of those factors or one of those things that we have, mechanisms. And uh, some of our reefs are located in places where you aren't allowed to take anything off the seafloor. Um, but uh, they, are, they will be open to fishing, but um, yeah, you, you aren't allowed to remove any, the part of the reef, unless it's for research purposes. Thank you, very interesting. Uh, I've lived at Henley for about 25 years, and I used to snorkel and all that for a long time. I noticed that the seagrass has died quite significantly down there over the time although the, the beach is much, much cleaner these days. But I sit, we don't live far from an outlet where the council runs storm water full of faces, oil, all sorts of rubbish into the water constantly. Is that having an impact on your reef or does this clean there muck up? Well, the Glenelg Reef is located near the Padawalunga outlet and the O'Sullivan Beach Reef is located near an outlet down at Christie's Beach as well. And we do that on purpose because we know they like clean, cleaning up some of those pollutants like phosphates. So, um, so I don't... Whether what's coming off Henley Beach is reaching this reef and, and, is, and is actually creating some food sources, obviously the pollutants can be problematic, but there can be things in the runoff that, are, that the oysters will actually clean up. Um, but I don't know enough about that situation. And with regards to the seagrass, I think that's something that um, everybody has noticed, that green line keeps moving back from the shore. Um, but we know that there's a synergy with, where there's oyster reefs, there's seagrass, and, and there's a lot of work being done by our researchers and the, the university researchers here in Adelaide and, and at Flinders around how we can build up that synergy and actually restore oysters, seagrass and kelp too along our coastline so that it's actually really bringing back that biodiversity that we had. The other thing is I've caught a lot of crabs down there over the years. Uh, they're very good at Henley, but a friend of mine gave me a heap of sand crabs from near the sewer farm. They're the, the biggest crabs I've ever seen. They have the filthiest inside that you would never eat them. So, you know, there are issues to my mind with pollution along Adelaide coastline. And yep. I don't think councils are doing enough to clean the water up mm. before it hits the sea. Well, we've, we've mapped the Adelaide coastline and there's, it's highly suitable for restoration, so if we can convince the government to keep investing in reefs, $1.5 million for the South Australian or federal government isn't very much every year when you look at the impacts it can have. So, so we're all about, you know, let's, let's try and keep building these all along the coast. But we definitely recommend you don't eat them. Go to a farm <laughs> and get something that's safe. I noticed that, that, that a hectare of these reefs, reefs will result in, in 250 or 270 kilograms of nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, the, the chemicals which are coming off as pollution, pollutants into the Great Barrier Reef are nitrogen and phosphorus coming off the phosphates from the sugar cane areas. Yep. And, and, and yet I noticed that the reefs that you're developing stop around about Rockhampton. And so, so there's a whole area of, of, of Great Barrier Reef which could benefit from their ability to pick up nitrogen and phosphorus. Is mm. there some work going on that, uh, up there also? Mm. I mean, that's, that's a really great point. But um, I think uh, as far as the Great Barrier Reef goes, it's important to maintain uh, an ecosystem that reflects, you know, what that coral reef is and not to introduce any new species to it. But uh, with regards to the reef, uh, I know that our, my organisation is looking at the source of that runoff rather than the reef itself. So let's look at the farmland and let's look at the Cape and, and those areas adjacent to the reef and what can, we do, what can be done to limit or reduce, yeah, the, the, the runoff because, yeah, it is a big problem, agreed. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Tanya, for that fantastic project. Please, please stay here.